Hello again. This is section 5.2, trigonometric functions of real numbers. And so what we're going to look at in this section now is how the stuff that we learned in section 5.1 with our unit circle is related to all of those special angle relationships that we've already looked at in chapter six. So this is now going to give us that connection between the two in an organizational way that we can remember the sine, cosine, tangent, and so on of those special angles. All right, so first thing we want to look at here is that if we have the ordered pair, the terminal point of a point along the unit circle, that's actually going to give us a sine value and a cosine value for that specific t value. So notice here that when we have our x and our y, the x value is going to give us the cosine and the y value is going to give us the sine. And so as soon as you know what that terminal point is, we automatically know sine and cosine for that angle. Now, once we have those two pieces of information, we know that tangent is just sine over cosine, and so we can just take the y value over the x value, and that's going to give us our tangent. And then the other three, as always, are just reciprocals of the first three, so we get one over y for our cosecant, one over x for our secant, and then x over y for our cotangent. All right, so let's see if we can find all six of our trig functions for each of these values of t now. All right, so first thing we want to do here, we're looking at pi over three. So I'm going to think about my unit circle. I'm going to think about where pi over three is, which is in the first quadrant right up here. And I'm going to think about the terminal point at pi over three. And so if you remember back in section 5.1, we talked about these terminal points. Terminal point here is going to be one half square root of three over two. Right, now, once we have that, now we just need to find the sine, cosine, tangent, and then cosecant, secant, and cotangent for that pi over three. So we're gonna say sine of pi over three is equal to, remember the sine is gonna be the y value. So we look at our y value to get sine, and that's gonna be square root of three over two. All right, now we can do cosine pi over three. And the cosine should just be the x value. So that's going to give us one half. Now, tangent of pi over three, we can just take the sine value over the cosine value or the y value over the x value. So we're taking square root of three over two divided by one half. Now, when we divide fractions, remember we can multiply by the reciprocal. So we're going to get square root of 3 over 2 times 2 over 1. In this case, the 2s cancel out, and so I'm just left with square root of 3 over 1, which is square root of 3. Now, once I have those, now we can just find their reciprocals, and that'll give us the other 3. So it's cosecant pi over 3 should just be the reciprocal of sine, so that's two over the square root of three. Secant should just be the reciprocal of cosine, so that's gonna be two over one or just two. And finally, cotangent of pi over three should just be the reciprocal of tangent, which is gonna be one over square root of three. Now, if you would like to rationalize those answers and get rid of the radicals in the denominator, feel free to do that. That will give you then those special values that we had in our chart in chapter six. I'm okay with the answers as they are here, but if you do rationalize, then they'll actually match the values that you saw in the chart in chapter six. All right, now let's look at one half, or sorry, pi over two. Again, we're gonna sketch this out. Pi over two, right up here. And so again, we need to think about what's the terminal point at pi over two. Well, our x value is gonna be zero and the y value is gonna be one there. So once we have that, now we can start finding our trig functions. So sine of pi over two. Again, sine, we're looking at the y value. So that's gonna be one cosine pi over two. Now we're looking at our x value. That's going to be zero. 
And then tangent of pi over two is gonna be the sine over the cosine, the y value over the x value, so one over zero. Now remember, we can never divide by zero, and so this value here is undefined. Now once we have those three, we find the other three by doing reciprocals. Cosecant pi over two is just gonna be the reciprocal of one, which is still one over one. Secant pi over two. Since we have a zero for our cosine, that's like zero over one, that's gonna give us one over zero as the reciprocal. And again, we can't divide by zero, so that value is undefined. And then finally, our cotangent should be the reciprocal of tangent. Tangent was one over zero, so this time we're gonna get zero over one. Zero over one is just zero. In general, if you ever get zero for a value, its reciprocal is going to be undefined. Um, and if you ever get undefined for a value, its reciprocal should be zero. All right, now this slide here is just showing us that relationship between our unit circle and those special values that we saw in our chart in back, back in chapter six, right? So notice here, if you're looking for, let's say, the cosine of pi over four. Well, we know from chapter six that, that should be square root of two over two, but now I can use my unit circle. I can go to pi over four. Since I'm looking at cosine, I'm gonna look at the X value and the cosine of pi over four then should be square root of two over two. And again, with our tangent and our cotangent, because we're doing that division of either Y over X or X over Y, Sometimes you're going to end up with those square roots in denominators. And if you rationalize those and get the square root out of the denominator, that's what's going to give you some of these values that you see here, um, even though the values when you divide would have square roots in the denominator. All right, now the domain of our trig functions, and this will make a lot more sense when we get to section 5.3 and we start looking at the graphs of these functions. Okay, it's important to know what values we can actually substitute into these trig functions for right now. Uh, but when we start looking at the graphs, you'll understand why these domains are what they are. Sine and cosine domain is all real numbers. So we can actually put any value we want into a sine or a cosine function. Now with tangent and secant, it's gonna be all real numbers except for pi over two plus multiples of pi. Okay, so basically if I take pi over two and add pi or two pi or three pi or four pi to that, any of those values are going to give us an undefined result, okay? And so we're going to get um, something that doesn't work for the domain there. With cotangent and cosecant, it's going to be all real numbers other than just multiples of pi. So 1 pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, all of those values don't work in cotangent and cosecant. Any other real number should work, though. And again, we'll look more at those domains when we start looking at the graphs of these functions. Now, the information at the bottom here is something, again, we saw in chapter six, okay? So in quadrant one, all of our functions are gonna have positive values, right? And if you remember in quadrant one, X and Y are both positive, which means the sine is positive, the cosine is positive, and when I divide those to get tangent, I'm also gonna get a positive, right? And so that's why everything is positive there. In quadrant two now, the sine and its reciprocal cosecant are gonna be the positive values. Everything else has to be negative. Well, the reason for that is that in that second quadrant, we have a negative X and a positive Y. Since sine is the Y value, we get a positive value for sine, we get a negative value for cosine, and when I divide Y by X, I get a negative value for tangent as well. Now in the third quadrant, remember we said tangent and cotangent should be positive. The reason for that is that our X and Y are both negative here. So sine is negative, cosine is negative. But when I divide Y over X, a negative over a negative becomes a positive, and that's why tangent is positive in that quadrant. And then finally, in the fourth quadrant, we have a positive X and a negative Y. That means that sine is negative this time, cosine is positive. And again, when I divide a negative by a positive to get tangent, it's gonna be negative as well. 
So if you just remember the signs of the X and Y values and that X is cosine and Y is sine, then that should help you to remember which values are going to be positive or negative in each of those quadrants now. All right, so let's see if we can find each of these values. So we're looking for cosine of two pi over three. So first thing we wanna do is actually locate where is two pi over three. So we're gonna sketch this out. Now I know this is bigger than pi over two. I also know that it's smaller than pi. So we're gonna be in the second quadrant and it's gonna be right up here. So two pi over three. Now, what I want to do, I want to find my reference number. And so if you remember, when we're looking for reference numbers, we're trying to find what's that distance back to the x-axis now. And so I'm going to do pi minus 2 pi over 3. Find your common denominator, which gives us 3 pi over 3 minus 2 pi over 3. And so pi over 3 is our reference number this time. So this is what we called T bar in the previous section. Now pi over three is right over here. And its ordered pair, its terminal point is one half square root of three over two. So now recall, we can say, well, that's just a reflection over the Y axis into the second quadrant now, which is gonna make our X value negative. So we get negative one half square root of three over two as our terminal point at two pi over three. So all of these steps up to this point are exactly what we did in section 5.1, right? That's why we did that work there. Once we have that terminal point, now we should be able to locate cosine because remember the cosine is just gonna be the X value of that terminal point. So I'm looking at my X value of my terminal point here and that tells me that cosine of two pi over three should just be equal to negative one half. All right, so now let's look at negative pi over three. Again, I'm gonna sketch it out first. Now, since it's a negative angle, that's gonna take us in the clockwise direction. I'm only going pi over three though. That's gonna keep us in the fourth quadrant. So this is gonna be negative pi over three right here. Again, I need my reference number. Now in this case, right, it's pretty easy to see that we just have a reflection here over the x-axis of pi over three, right? That distance should be the same there. And just like the first example there, that ordered pair, that terminal point is going to be one half square root of three over two. Now, since this one is just a reflection over the x axis, that means our y value becomes negative, the x stays positive, so we get one half negative square root of three over two. So, again, all those steps are exactly what we did in section 5.1. We're just trying to find that terminal point at the indicated angle or T value. Once we have that terminal point to find tangent, remember we're gonna do sine over cosine or Y over X. So we're gonna take the Y value, negative square root of three over two. We're gonna divide it by the X value, one half. We can multiply by the reciprocal. So negative square root of three over two times two over one. Twos cancel out. And I'm left with negative square root of three over one, or just negative square root of three. All right, and our last one here, we're looking at 19 pi over four. Now, immediately I recognize this is too big to be within one full revolution. So I'm gonna start by subtracting off revolutions. I'm gonna subtract two pi from this. So 19 pi over four minus two pi. So I need a common denominator here. So we're gonna do 19 pi over four minus eight pi over four. 
and that should give us 11 pi over 4. Now, 2 pi is 8 pi over 4, so 11 pi over 4 is still bigger than a full revolution, so I'm going to do it again. 11 pi over 4 minus 2 pi. 11 pi over 4 minus 8 pi over 4. And when I do that, that should give us 3 pi over 4. Now, 3 pi over 4 is smaller than 2 pi, so now at least we're within a full revolution. So I'm going to sketch this out. So basically, we've gone all the way around twice, right? So we subtracted off two full revolutions. And then we're going to end up at 3 pi over 4. Well, 3 pi over 4, that's bigger than pi over 2, but smaller than pi. It's going to end up right here in the second quadrant, halfway between pi over 2 and pi. So this is my 19 pi over 4 now. Now, to find that terminal point, I need to figure out what's my reference number. So I'm measuring this arc length here. And so that's going to give us pi minus 3 pi over 4. Common denominator is 4 pi over 4 minus 3 pi over 4. And so pi over 4 is our reference number. So we're looking at this point over here in the first quadrant. And that terminal point at pi over 4 is square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2. Now, because I'm in the second quadrant now, I know that makes my x value negative. So this terminal point is going to be negative square root of 2 over 2, positive square root of 2 over 2. And this time, since I'm looking at sine, I'm looking at the y value. So I'm taking the y value here. And so this should be equal to positive square root of 2 over 2. Again, in general, we're just following all the same steps that we did in section 5.1 to locate that T value, find its terminal point. And then once we have the terminal point, then we have all the information we need to find any of the six trig functions that we want. All right, now this time we're gonna have to use a calculator. Okay? And so it's telling us to find, in this case, sine of 2.2. Now, we do want to make sure we're in radian mode. Okay, so on your calculator, just make sure you've got your calculator in radians. And we're just going to take the sine of 2.2. And I'm going to round all of these to four decimal places. Again, in WebAssign, just pay attention to what they're telling you to round to. So this should give us 0 0.8085. Next one here, cosine of 1.1, again in radian mode, cosine 1.1 to four decimal places should give us 0.4536. All right, now with cotangent, we do not have a cotangent key, so we're going to have to change this to a reciprocal. So this is going to be one over the tangent of 28. Okay, so we do 1 divided by tangent of 28. We should get negative 3.5533. And then finally, cosecant. Again, no cosecant key on our calculator, so we have to do a reciprocal. Cosecant is a reciprocal of sine. So we get 1 over the sine of 0.98. And that should give us 1.2041. So again, just always pay attention to how many decimal places are being asked for. If there's no degree symbol, we assume radians. Okay, and so make sure your calculator's in radian mode if there is no degree symbol. All 
All right, now, even in odd properties. So sine, cosecant, tangent, cotangent are what we call odd functions. And then the cosine and the secant are what we call even functions. When we look at the graphs of these, you'll see that that means that they have certain types of symmetry graphically, but it's also helpful when we're looking at our values of these trig functions because that means that the sine of a negative t value is actually just equal to negative sine of that positive t value. And so if you know the sine of the positive value, then we can just make the overall value negative and that'll give us the sine of negative t. Now with cosine, because it's an even function, the cosine of negative t is actually equal to the cosine of t. And so we can basically just drop the negative all together, find the cosine of t, and it'll have the same value as cosine of negative t. And then tangent, just like sine, is an odd function. So tangent of negative t is equal to the negative tangent of t. Now, these are basically just shortcut properties. So it's one of those things that if you don't want to have to work with it and you just want to identify where's the negative angle, find its terminal point, right? You can go through those same steps and we don't even have to worry about these properties. If you like working with positive angles more, then this is useful because now we can change these to positive angles, think about them in that way instead, find their terminal points. And so if that's easier for you, then that's when you would want to know these properties. All right, so let's see if we can use those even odd properties here to find the value of each of these trig functions. All right, so first one we're looking at sine of negative pi over six. So if I use my even odd properties, sine is an odd function, which means I can rewrite this as negative sine of pi over six. So now all I want to do is find the sine of pi over six, which is one of those values from our unit circle, pi over six right up here. Its terminal point, square root of three over two, one half. Since we're trying to find the sine of that, we're looking at the y value. So I'm looking right here. So sine of pi over six is one half. I need to make it negative. So it's going to be negative one half. Yeah, and that's exactly the same thing you would have gotten if you had just done the sine of negative pi over six to begin with, because negative pi over six would be right down here. In this case, we have square root of three over two, negative one half as our ordered pair. And since we're looking at the y value, we get negative one half. Again, this just prevents you from having to deal with negative angles, right? We make them positive, and then we add the negative in front of it's an odd function or we just drop the negative all together if it's an even function. Okay, so our next one here, we're looking for cosine negative pi over four. So if we wanna use our even odd properties, in this case, cosine is an even function. So this is just gonna be equal to the cosine of positive pi over four. Again, pi over four is one of our special angles right up here terminal point square root of two over two square root of two over two and this time cosine we're looking at the x value and so we're going to get square root of two over two and again if you don't like the even odd properties don't want to use them you could have just looked at negative pi over four which is going to be down here in the fourth quadrant this ordered pair is square root of two over two negative square root of two over two right because only the y value becomes negative because of that reflection since we're looking at cosine we're looking at the x value and notice here it stays positive, which is why we still get a positive square root of two over two as our answer here. So yeah, there's never gonna be a time where I force you to use an even odd property. It's really up to you whether you wanna work with a negative angle or if you wanna make it a positive by using this property. 
Right, now, some fundamental identities. Now, these are all identities that we looked at in chapter six with thetas. Now we're using key values, but the properties are exactly the same. So cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, so we get one over sine. Secant is the reciprocal of cosine, that's one over cosine. Cotangent, reciprocal of tangent, right? Tangent, we already talked about, is just sine over cosine, and then co cotangent, because it's the reciprocal, is just cosine over sine. So all of those reciprocal identities we've seen before, they're exactly the same. Same thing with the Pythagorean identities, right? We talked about in chapter six that sine squared plus cosine squared is always equal to one. We're just using a T value instead of a theta value now. That's the only difference. Tangent squared plus one is equal to secant squared and one plus cotangent squared is equal to cosecant squared. So all these identities are exactly the same. Nothing has changed. All right, so if cosine of T is equal to three fifths and t is in quadrant four, we want to find the values of the other trig functions. Now, I do want to try to do this using our identities that we just saw, right? Just to get some practice with that. So, the first thing I'm going to do is say, well, I've got cosine. What other trig function could I find using my identities? Well, I do have one that says that sine squared t plus cosine squared t has to be equal to one. And this time I know cosine, so by substituting that in, I should be able to find sine. So we're going to have sine squared t plus, in place of cosine now, I'm putting three fifths, and cosine gets squared, and that should be equal to one now. Now, solving this, we get sine squared t plus, by square three-fifths, I'm squaring the numerator, squaring the denominator, that's 9 over 25. Now I need to subtract 9 over 25 from both sides. Uh, 1 is just 25 over 25, so if I do 25 over 25 minus 9 over 25, give us 16 over 25. And then finally, we take our square root of both sides to get sine by itself. So we get sine of t equals, and then just don't forget, when we take a square root like this, we get a positive and a negative answer. Square root of 16 is 4, square root of 25 is 5, so plus or minus 4 fifths. Now, we only want one value for sine. So at this point, we look and say, well, they tell us we're in quadrant four. So we have to think about in quadrant four, is sine going to be positive or is it going to be negative, right? And if you remember your quadrants, all students take calculus. Cosine is the one that's positive in the fourth quadrant. That means that sine is going to be negative. So we're going to take the negative sine here. The other way to think about that is sine is the y value. The y value in the fourth quadrant should be negative. So that's why we're taking a negative value here. All right, so now we have our sine. We have our cosine. So next we can find tangent because tangent should just be sine over cosine. And if I divide, we get tangent t is equal to negative four-fifths over cosine, which is three-fifths. When we divide fractions, we're multiplying by the reciprocal, so negative four-fifths times five-thirds. Fives cancel out, and we're left with negative four over three. So now I have my sine, I have my cosine, I have my tangent. So now it's just a matter of finding all the reciprocals. So cosecant of t should just be the reciprocal of sine. So that's going to be negative 5 over 4. Secant of t should just be the reciprocal of cosine. And that's going to be 5 thirds. And cotangent of t should just be the reciprocal of tangent. So that's going to give us negative 3 over 4.
and that's it. All right, we found all six of our trig functions and we're done. Now, the other way you could have done this problem is exactly what we did in chapter six, where we say, well, let's think of T as our angle. Let's set up a right triangle where the adjacent side is three, the hypotenuse is five, use Pythagorean theorem to find your opposite side, which would be four. And once you know you're adjacent, you're opposite and your hypotenuse, then you can actually set up all of these relationships. And again, just keeping in mind that you're in quadrant four, that's gonna make certain things positive or negative. So again, the identities work, or if you wanna set up a right triangle and do it that way, that works also. Again, I'm never gonna force you to do it one way or the other. I just want you to be familiar with both, right? Because some people like the algebra, some people like the geometry. All right, now last example for this section. We wanna write tangent in terms of cosine where T is in quadrant three. All right, so what we want to do here is we want to use our identities, see if we can get everything right in our tangent formula in terms of cosine. So I'm going to start here by saying, well, the only formula I know that has tangent and cosine in it is tangent of T is equal to sine of T over cosine of T. So now I have tangent in terms of sine and cosine, but I just want tangent in terms of cosine. So now I need to see if there's a way that I can change this sine to be in terms of cosine instead. Well, we do have an identity that says that sine squared t plus cosine squared t has to be equal to 1. So if I solve this for sine now, that should give me sine in terms of cosine. I substitute that back in, and then I have everything in terms of cosine. So solve for sine, I'm going to subtract the cosine squared. So that gives us sine squared t equals 1 minus cosine squared t. Now I need to take the square root. So that gives us sine of t equals, and again, don't forget your plus or minus positive or negative, square root, one minus cosine squared t. Now, this time, they tell us we're in quadrant three. So this is how we're gonna choose which sign we wanna go with. Since we're in quadrant three, we're, we saw, we'll solve for a sign. We know sine in quadrant three should be negative. So I'm gonna take the negative value right here. Now that I have sine, now I can substitute all of this in for sine up here. So we get tangent of t is equal to negative square root 1 minus cosine squared t over cosine of t. And now we have tangent just in terms of cosine, and we're done. Again, anytime it asks you to find one trig function in terms of another, you know you're going to be dealing with those identities. Think about which identities have both of the trig functions that you're working with. Start with that. And if you still have more than just that trig function that you're looking for in there, think about ways that you could then get that one in terms of the other one. All right, so that's all we've got for section 5.2. As always, if you have any questions on the homework, please let me know, and I will see you next time.